International Treaty of an Inspirational Fashion. Uh, this time we invited Ad van den Oort. Uh, me and Ad uh, met at an, at an event of Stichting Management Studies. KLM is a participant of Stichting Management Studies. We contribute and in return uh, we get valuable research uh, that's applicable for um, our company. And one of the research that was performed last year, last year? Yes. Yeah. Uh, was about game changers and every year they present the outcome of the research and they do that by means of a book presentation and the book was written by uh, Ad and his research team and he will now present to us uh, the results, the outcomes. So yep. welcome Ad. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, well, my name is Ad van der Noord. At the moment I'm a researcher at the Euronymous Academy of Data Science which is a joint venture between Eindhoven University of Technology and Tilburg University on uh, the subject of data science. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, yeah, because it's a pretty hot topic. Uh, Tilburg and, and Eindhoven decided to join forces and actually start a new graduate school, school in Zetterenbos. And there I'm currently researching uh, into data-driven organizations. So how organizations actually use data to improve the organization and to improve their uh, decision-making processes. Um, but this is not the presentation of today. Today I'm going to present uh, our research on game changers and how Dutch companies uh, actually change the games. Or uh, it's about how certain Dutch companies have changed hi, uh, certain industries and markets in the Netherlands. Um, as Robin mentioned, this research was conducted uh, in uh, more or less an assignment by the Stichting Management Studies. They basically every year they uh, invite scholars to submit a proposal uh, about a certain topic to do research. Uh, so they had a call for research on game changers and we submitted a proposal and uh, the research was awarded to us. Uh, so we conducted the research and this is the outcome, this book is the outcome of this uh, research. And what they then do, they distribute the book to their members uh, 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 so that they can actually learn uh, something about the topic. Um, the research question uh, for this research was basically twofold. On the one hand, how do game changers disrupt markets and industries? Uh, what are game, game changers? Uh, how do they uh, come into existence? And on the other hand, um, how can incumbents or, or existing players of the game actually defend their position? What can, they, what can they do? How can they arm themselves against game changers? Uh, what can they do to prevent uh, uh, becoming extinct, more or less? Um, so the structure of this presentation is the same as the structure of the book. Uh, it will consist of five parts. In the first part, it's more of an introduction about what game changers are, a little bit about the history of game changers, uh, whether the game is changing at a more rapid pace, whether the, the, the pace of change is increasing or not. Uh, basically, we here we want to also provide a definition of what, what actually is a game changer. Uh, in the second part, we will uh, look more uh, into the characteristics of the game changer. What we will find is actually that the game changers have uh, what we will refer to as paradoxical characteristics. Um, and in this part, we try to answer the question of how, how organizations actually can, or, or individuals, uh, can become a game changer. Part three is about the defense. Uh, so we list a number of defensive strategies. Uh, these strategies are dependent on the type of game changer that an organization is confronted with, the, the level of threat, the size of the threat, the urgency of the threat, of a game changer. Uh, so here we try to answer the question, how can existing players actually deal with, with, with game changers? What can they do? Um, part four is about the reinforcements. Uh, so this is more of a systems perspective towards game changers. And the fifth part is uh, a little bit about the insights. Uh, what, what have we learned uh, wrapping things up a little bit? Um, just in terms of the format. If you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. For me, it's not a problem at all. So um, then the uh, research method, 
basically, and this is a little bit uh, contrary to the traditional approach within the stiffening management studies, generally there people write uh, a book about a subject that they already know well. So there's not really a lot of novel research being done. Uh, here we decided for a different approach. On the one hand, we did a more of a top-down approach, studying the literature, what does the literature say about game changers, the types of game changers, possible defenses by incumbents. Um, but on the other hand, we also chose to do uh, what in the academic literature is called a grounded research. And grounded research basically means that uh, instead of having some uh, theories uh, that you use to guide your research, basically what you do is you look at the raw data. So for this research, we conducted 26 interviews with uh, Dutch game changers and also some interviews with uh, incumbents upon their reaction um, and also interviews in the uh, Dutch dance. Um, and then basically what we did, we conducted these interviews, recorded these interviews, transcribed them, and then actually started coding the interviews. Okay, what do people say? Uh, what are the things that are important? What do they say is important? Because these interviews were all with the founders of the Game Changers, so the people that actually started and uh, uh, started the company. Uh, uh, why did they start it? How did they evolve? What did they do? What were the decisions that they made? So then we actually really look at the raw data to see what kind of patterns emerge from, this, from these interviews. And then in the book, we basically combine the theoretical insights from studying the literature with the insights we got from uh, looking at the raw data. And um, well, the book is the, more or less the result of this. Um, sorry? The Dutch dance, well, this is the, the uh, wait, let me see if this is the next, no, not yet. Well, here we conducted interviews with 26, uh, interviews with Dutch game changers, booking.com, takeaway, bing bong, bugaboo and so on and so forth. Well, this is more of a cross-sectional approach. So by looking at different industries, game changers in different phases, uh, interviewing them. The Dutch dance, what we did here is more of a longitudinal case study over time to look at the origin and the evolution of the Dutch dance industry, which is now more or less the most successful, or one of the most successful export industries in the Netherlands. So here we interviewed the key players to see how did it start uh, and how did it evolve to actually become a, a really successful industry. So that's more of a, 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 let's say, a bigger game. It's a real industry that was created, uh, uh, the Dutch dance industry. Yes, um, about game changers. Well, a nice example in the sport is by William Webb Ellis, who uh, during a soccer game actually took up the took the ball in his hands and started running, thereby creating the, 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 the defining characteristic of rugby. So he was really a game changer. Instead of adhering to the f soccer games, he just took the ball in his hands and started running. And this actually created a new game. So in sports, we have game changers, but also uh, in other sectors. For example, Napoleon, uh, what he did is when he was uh, he really changed the game in terms of warfare, in the sense that his Grand Armée, the way he organized it, he organized it in, in small autonomous units. And because he organized it in such a way, well, generally we had like these big armies with the big field battles, and he organized it in small autonomous units, hereby making his army much more flexible, adaptable. And it actually took his competitors, so to say, uh, or his enemies, Spain and, and Germany, uh, a long time before they could actually deal with this different kind of, of, of warfare. So based... Sorry? Uh, maybe you'll get it, but is there a definition when a game changer is a game changer? Because it can change yes. at some point without being a game changer, I think. Yes, yes, we will... Uh, I will come to the definition. Because here this is just a little bit of exploration on different types of game changers, a little bit about the history. Um, here, because you can also look at changes of the games on a different level. This is more an overview of uh, some generic innovations that really changed, uh, well, society as a whole. For example, the invention of the wheel, uh, or, or, or iron, or, or electricity, the airplane, uh, uh, computer, and, 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 and so on. So basically, 
the changes of the game are, are a phenomenon that happen all the time uh, in, in all kinds of domains over the ages. Uh, let's say, yeah, here we go back about nine to, no, about 11, 12,000, no, 10, 11,000 years. So it's basically, if you look at the history of man, there, all, there have always been changes to the game. Yes, good question. This is actually an introduction to the next slide. Um, because a lot of people argue that actually the, the, the most of the major changes to the games are, are more or less parallel with the different industrial revolutions. So uh, with the invention of the steam engine, uh, the origin of the first industrial revolution, that then most of the changes were in this period. Then you had a period of stability, and then you had the scientific revolution, the electronic revolution, and the cyber revolution. But uh, in our opinion, this is actually not the case. So it's not that just in the beginning of this industrial revolution, you, you had a lot of game changes and then a period where it was less and then a lot more. Uh, because basically, if you look at an, an, a, a revolution, it's not a single point in time. Well, if it's a political revolution, maybe more. But an industrial revolution, it's an invention. And then this invention, like the steam engine, is basically diffuses throughout different markets, different industries over a longer period of time, and then you will see game changes in these different industries stretched out over time. Uh, although, obviously, within the different scientific revolutions, some changes happen more at the beginning for certain industries, uh, let's say the trains, or, or and, and sometimes it might take longer. In terms of the time aspect, well, I can look. So here we have listed some of the um, uh, we've listed some of the uh, game changers on a temporal scale, and basically you see that, that game changes can arise uh, at any point in time. Now, about the question whether the games whether the game is actually changing faster, we can again look at the uh, timing of industrial revolutions. So the first uh, uh, industrial revolution started about mid 18th century. And then it took about 120 years for the second revolution to start. And then after 80 years, the third revolution started. Now we're more or less in the cyber revolution uh, in 60 years. So maybe in about 40 years, we can expect uh, the fifth industrial revolution. So here, if you look at the timing of industrial revolutions, it does seem that it's going at a faster pace. And this is actually confirmed by, uh, if you look at the speed of technology adoption, while it took about 46 years for a quarter of the uh, American population to adopt electricity, it was only 26 years for the TV, and only 16 for the PC, and seven for the internet. If you will look at the smartphone, it's probably, I would guess, three to five years. So it's going way faster and faster. Uh, so even though the game changes can, or changes to the game, or game changers can originate at any point in time, it does seem to be uh, speeding up a lot. Now, are they game changers? And what kind of game changers? For example, Johan Cruyff, he, defended, he invented more or less a different style of playing soccer. Uh, 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 is he a game changer? Well, de he definitely changed the rules of the game. Maybe not the explicit rules, but definitely the implicit rules on uh, to the kind of strategy that you use to play a game. And for uh, a long time, we were successful. Now, at least Dutch football is not so successful anymore. Um, another example, Donald Trump. Is he a game changer with his nationalist, uh, populist uh, politics? Or, or Einstein? I would argue that Einstein is actually a different kind of game changer because he invented, uh, with his invention of the theory of relativity, he basically created a pillar for quantum mechanics, which is more or less a whole new game. So instead of changing the game within more or less a fixed set of borders, he actually created a whole new game with more or less no or maybe fluid borders. Um, the definition that we, will, that we use in our book of a game changer is an individual or organization who drastically changes the written or unwritten rules of the game, the 
competitive games because we're mostly looking at companies or create a whole new game. So here we already see a distinction between game changers in a, let's say, a, a, a fixed game that just changed the rule of that game. Let's say you have the game of chess instead of moving the uh, uh, bishop. In this way, we're going to move it a little bit different or the ones that create a completely new game. So instead of, instead of chess, you invent checkers. Um, if we look at the dimensions of a change of the game, this is also a little bit part of the definition. Now we can make a distinction between the impact that a game changer has and with the impact we refer to the uh, amount of behavior that the, uh, uh, the players of the game have to change. So for example, the impact of the iPhone is to what, to what extent does it actually change the behavior of people using iPhones? How much of our lives is affected by the iPhone? Uh, the scope of a, a, a game changer, this is more the number and the type of players that have to adjust the behavior. So the introduction of the iPhone not only impacted the consumers, it also impacted the producers of, of, of telephones because suddenly there was the smartphone, which, were much, which was much more competitive than the traditional phones. Uh, with the apps and stuff, you have a, a lot of different type of players, game developers, app developers, that are also affected. So this is another dimension of the, let's say, uh, a game changer. Uh, you can also look at levels. So the horizontal level, the supply chain with the producer, uh, the, 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 the supplier, uh, then the consumer or horizontally, Apple, for example, has changed the game in, 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 in different industries, in the music industry, the smartphone industry, uh, the, 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 the computer industry, the frequency with which a game has changed. Some change the game, some are one-off. The one-trick ponies, they change the game and that's it. Uh, Booking.com, for example, or even though it's highly successful until now, it has only changed the game once. Apple, on the other hand, has changed the games on numerous occasions, so it's more of a sequential game changer. And then the domains that are impacted. Here you can think about the economic uh, domain, the political domain, social domain, and all these things. So basically, these are different dimensions uh, that can be used to define uh, game changers. So now that I've uh, explained a something went wrong. has encountered a problem. Uh, let's see. Okay, so now that I've explained a little bit more about game changers, the different dimensions, uh, the different characteristics, provided definition, uh, talked a little bit about the speed. Um, I want to talk, I want to dig a little bit deeper into the characteristics of game changers, so uh, the attack. And as I mentioned before, for this uh, part of the research, we've uh, interviewed 26 Dutch game changers. And basically what we did here is we wanted to look at, 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 at firms, entrepreneurs, organizations from different industries. Let's say uh, Aerialtronics is a drone developer, Snapcar, a car sharing platform. Uh, Elastic, you might know, it's more of a uh, the Google in the box. Yep, the, 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 the child seats for in the back of your bike. Um, Mimetos, they make organs on a chip for to develop medicine. Um, uh, Thuisbezorgd, that deliver food. So basically we wanted to have a sample from a different range of industries because we're re really interested in the characteristics of what basically is similar amongst these different types of game changer. How can we actually, or what are actually the characteristics of a generic game changer uh, and not just a specific one in a certain industry. On the other hand, what we also did is we wanted to have game changers at a different phase of the, let's say, game changing process. Some of them are, were game changers a long time ago. Bing Bong uh, started changing the game in about 2005 and they more or less finished uh, in 2015, more or less, when all the banks basically offered the same platform as, as what they did. For the ones that don't know Bing Bank, Bing Bank is actually an internet 
uh, website platform for individual investors where you can buy and sell stocks. Uh, and before that, you can only buy and sell stocks by calling the bank, getting an account manager, but now you could do it online, way cheaper, um, but that was already a long time ago. Another one, which is a pretty young one, is Bird Control Group. Uh, they're, as far as I know, also uh, working for Schiphol. And I don't know if you know this uh, one, probably not, but they chase away birds by using lasers. So traditionally, birds can be a really big problem, especially for uh, an, uh, uh, an airfield, I guess, with the planes coming and going, and if the uh, birds go in the engines, it can actually be a big problem. But also for oil refineries, uh, uh, chemical plants, birds can be a really big problem. And before Bird Control Group, there wasn't really a good solution for this. Well, you could use nets, you could use sounds, but these would not really work consistently. So what uh, Steinar uh, developed is actually a laser, and he adjusted the frequency so that birds are actually become scared if you use this laser. And the characteristic is because he changed the frequency of the laser so it's not uh, harmful for your eyes or, or, or the pilots of the airplane. Um, but then for some, for some reason, the birds actually see it as a, 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 a tangible physical object. So they also don't get used to it. They will always remain scared. Uh, but this is, this is more not really a game changer even though they do have Schiphol as a customer. I think they recently also uh, acquired Texaco as a customer for the uh, offshore uh, drilling platforms uh, where birds can be a real issue because they also the excrements and, and people can slip and all these things also, or they can go somewhere and a fire can, 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 can start. Um, Southampton, I think as well, airport, but they're still at the beginning, so they're more of a challenger than actually a game changer, because a game changer, you only know in retrospect whether they were, were successful in changing the game or not. Okay, then uh, what, do we, what did we learn from this analysis? And this can basically be summarized by this slide, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And the reason is, is that game changers are have this kind of like dual personality on, 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 on many uh, aspects, uh, in the sense that on the one hand they're Dr. Jekyll, and on the other hand Mr. Hyde, but then combined in one person. And even though it might seem as a contradiction, actually game changers are able to surpass this contradiction and uh, see it more as an apparent contradiction or as a paradox. And this is related to a process what is known as Janusian thinking, which is basically a creative process where you have two opposing ideas or concepts and you view them together and you try to actually to integrate them. And if you're able to integrate them, you're basically able to no longer see them as a contradiction, but it's actually a part of a bigger whole. So it's uh, more a creative process and the contradiction turns into a paradox, where a paradox is an apparent contradiction that often goes against our, our sense of logic or our expectations. Um, and they, well, this is an example. Uh, this is a specific example where you can see two concepts as contradictions. For example, art versus commerce. And if you view these as contradictions and you place them on a continuum, then you can say, okay, Vincent van Gogh, was he an artist or was he really commercial? Now, obviously, he was a really, an artist. He was really crappy at commerce. He didn't make much money during his lifetime. So it's pretty easy to, to place him. But then if we have William Shakespeare, where do we place him on this continuum? I mean, he was definitely created a lot of art, so you would say that he's an artist. But he was also really successful commercially. So then you're kind of in a dilemma, okay, where do I place William Shakespeare, especially in comparison to Vincent van Gogh? But then the, basically the solution out of this problem is that it's not a continuum, it's not a contradiction, there are just two dimensions. It's the level of or the extent to which they are an artist and on the other hand the extent to which they are commercial. So and then in this sense you basically resolve the contradiction and Shakespeare and uh, Vincent van Gogh can be uh, equal 
equally good artists, so to say. Now, game changers uh, that we studied uh, basically do this, are able to balance the creative tension that exists at an, a, a number of different, uh, uh, in a number of different domains. In total, we have identified 15 domains. We have grouped them in a number of categories. The core, which is the mission, and here you have the tension between idealizing uh, and commercializing. I will go a little bit deeper into some of these, not all of them, but basically here, game changers, instead of choosing a fixed position on a continuum, so either doing one or the other, they basically balance and they're able to do, uh, well, they, they're able to maintain this balance, which then generates uh, uh, creativity and gives them the flexibility to adjust when needed. Okay, so an explanation. The mission paradox, and this is still in, uh, unfortunately, in Dutch because I copied it from the book, and only yesterday I started uh, changing it into English. But basically, the mission paradox is about two opposing or apparently uh, opposing uh, processes. And on the one hand, it's Id idealizing, and the other hand, it's commercializing. To, so to, so to a certain extent, it's related to the example I gave before of art versus commerce. So, and then idealizing is making the world a better place, is serving the common good, serving society. Uh, on the other hand, commercializing is serving my personal interest, is doing something to make myself better off, not make society better, make myself better off. And then, if you view these as a continuum, then uh, sometimes you can choose one of the extremes, but if you do, then this is why it's uh, colored in red, then you can, uh, uh, how do you say, step into the trap of the paradox. Because if you focus too much on idealizing, on making the world a better place, it's basically not realistic. Because you're, as a company, you're not making any money, you're just lo losing money, the only thing you're doing is you're thinking about other people, or, or making the world a better place, making the world happier or healthier or this or that, and you're not making any money, so that's not really realistic. On the other hand, an exclusive focus on commercializing is unethical or can become unethical. You're only thinking about yourself, you don't care about the uh, impact that it has on other people. Uh, and a nice example here is, let's say, the tobacco industry uh, or the weapons industry or the example that we work out in the book is about Eosta. Eosta is the largest distributor, distributor in organic uh, um, fruit and vegetables in the European Union. And Eosta was started by Volkert Engelsmann. And Volkert Engelsmann, he was working for Cargill. I don't know if you know Cargill, but Cargill is like a large ag agrochemical firm. And what Cargill is basically doing and what he noticed is basically they're creating monocultures and they're, they're trying to make the farmers as dependent upon them as possible. So they, they, they create these genetically modified seeds that a farmer can only use once, so the next year they have to buy it again. These seeds are pretty vulnerable, so they also have to buy a lot of pesticides to make sure that the crop actually survives. Uh, they also have to then use a lot of uh, fertilizers and stuff, and basically, selling more, but also not making the world really a better place because you use a lot of fresh water, you create a lot of dependency, they charge a lot of money, so the farmers themselves don't really make a lot of money, so basically they just maximize the, their own value. Um, and it also has some negative consequences for public health because the use of these pesticides, even though Individually, in let's say the, the FDA, it might be within limits for a certain crop. But the funny thing is these organizations never consider not just eating because then they look at how much pesticides are there on tomatoes. And then it might be within a certain range that's acceptable for public health. But then they never consider that you not only eat tomatoes, but also eat tomatoes and bananas and broccoli and then the combined effect, it has a really negative effect on our health. So what Volker decided to do, he decided to quit 
Cargill and start Aosta. And, what, and then he developed a business model that's basically more or less completely opposite to the business model of Cargill, where Cargill was trying to commodify the whole uh, supply chain, make everything the same as possible because they then they can trade it, buy it and sell it on the market, uh, extracting as much value for them individually. What Aosta did is, they ex did is actually make the supply chain individual again. Look at the supply chain, who's adding value where, make it transparent, make it transparent for the customer. Every product that you buy, it has a code on it and it actually shows who, who, uh, who was the farmer, uh, where did it uh, originate, uh, how much pollution is there, let's say from the uh, production to actually the consumption, uh, so also in terms of sustainability. But, so he really has an ideal, and this ideal is actually so big that a lot of um, uh, famous people like uh, Julia Roberts, uh, the Dalai Lama, uh, Desmond Tutu, they actually support Aosta. So he, he's getting a lot of traction by being idealistic. But he's also commercial at the same time because he realizes to actually be idealistic, to actually change the world for a better place, you need to make a profit as well because otherwise you're doing it for a couple of months and then you're out of business and poof, game over. So this is where the slogan comes from, where ecology meets economy or how he I, to use one of his own quotes, where idealism meets commercial realism. So instead of saying, okay, I'm going to do this or that, he's basically doing both at the same time and then to synthesize and balance these oppose or apparent opposing forces in the mission paradox. And having a look at time. The vision paradox. Um, and then you might say, but how come is this all, uh, if it's a new... How do you say, if it's a new model that you build from grounded theory, how come that they're all existing terms? But well, that's actually because we, on the one hand, we looked at the literature. On the one hand, we did the grounded theory to look at the data and combine the two. And then obviously, the labels, they come from the literature because uh, otherwise they would have been wrong for uh, so many years. The vision paradox is also pretty interesting, at least I find it interesting. I don't know if you would agree, but this is the, in terms of the vision of the company. It is on the one hand, you need to have a vision that you believe in. You really have to believe in the vision because if you want to accomplish something, there are a lot of obstacles that have to be overcome. You have to have a firm belief is that you can accomplish what you want to accomplish. But at the same time, you need to deny the same vision because if you don't, you become dogmatic and, and yeah, they krijg oogklep op, I don't know the English term, but you don't see what's changing around you anymore. And to actually keep an open mind, you need to deny it at the same time. A nice example was NLA, the Nederlandse Energiemaatschappij. They're basically an energy company, they sell energy, but Harald Swinkels, uh, the CEO, he actually sees the end of his own business model in five years. He believes that in five years, they will not make any money anymore by selling energy. But they're an energy company. So he sees the demise of his own business model in five years. And, but then on the same, at the same time, he's an energy company now. With a lot of people working for it, so they still need to believe in what they're doing. Otherwise, they will just say, well, if in five years we're out of business, so we might, have, might as well stop now. But then at the same time, it's an enabler to make a transition to actually become more of a data company or, uh, 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 as he also mentions, a consumer goods company, which is also the reason why now NLA is offering uh, television and internet and these things because they see their own, the end of their own business model. Again. Ik weet, ik weet dat ik weet het niet, maar ik, eerlijk gezegd gebruik ik ook deze niet zo heel. 
Maar het is wel een hele grote presentatie, dus ik vermoed dat dat het probleem kan zijn. Uh, wacht even. Ik kan er anders ook kiezen voor een andere optie. Even kijken hoe dat gaat. Ik heb voor de zekerheid ook op opgeslagen als pdf, dus misschien dat dat wat... View... Continuous scroll, single page, repeat, full screen... Command L? L. Nee. <laughs> nee. Ja, tenzij je hem liever zo wil zien hoor, dat mag ook voor mij. Nee, view full screen denk ik toch? Ergens Excel size. Ah ja, full screen. Ja, ik hoop dat dat beter gaat. Oh, dan krijgen we de twee tegelijkertijd. Ja? Single page, ja, kijk, dat moet hem zijn. Ja. Ja. Ja, Apple is leuk als het werkt. Als het niet werkt, dan is het een, kan het een drama zijn. Tenzij je weet hoe het moet. Maar. Um, een andere parado uh, another paradox is de capital paradox. Where you have the attention between on the, on, on the one hand investing and the one hand and on the other hand saving. And I think this is one of the uh, uh, really interesting paradoxes of game changers and, and often a, a highly important one. Um, because on the one hand, if you want to change a game, it basically it takes a long time. You have to convince other players to start playing the game. You're doing something different. You're going against the normal tradition. You have to convince people. So generally, it takes a longer time before you actually start making money. So then you would say the more money that a game changer has, the better. However, there are a number of dangers in having too much money. On the one hand, what then, uh, uh, or at least what a lot of game changers mentioned is that precisely the fact that they didn't have a lot of money that they had to save, that they were forced to search for unorthodox solutions that were cheaper, cut out some people in the supply chain to do it actually completely different, to use a different production process, to use different kinds of materials, while, at least this is what they say themselves, if they would have enough money, they would have just bought the normal, expensive, orthodox solutions. Um, another is, if you have a lot of money, you can waste it on a car, on a big headquarters. Uh, it's also easy if you, have a lot of, if you have enough money to separate yourself from the market, so you don't really have the interaction with customers and suppliers anymore. You don't really have the experimentation, the minimum viable products that you set out and then you get feedback and then adjust and iterate. So there are a lot of dangers in having uh, too much money. Obviously, if you don't have enough money, this is also uh, detrimental because you need money to invest. And this is actually an intricate balance. And a nice example, I think, is Thuisbezorgd. Because Thuisbezorgd, Jitze Groen, Groen, he decided to grow organically, or originally. He didn't want to have any venture capital precisely Because of this reason, he wanted to do everything by himself. He wanted to do it cheap and also not be uh, reliant upon others where he, could, where he would ju just be able to buy technology. However, at a certain point, he was competing in Germany. And in Germany, they were in fourth place. And then he realized what they're in fourth place. He wanted to grow organically. And then he was thinking, okay, I have to basically spend money to grow more market share. But then the problem is with this uh, industry, uh, with the meal delivery, that people that actually use these services are really loyal. They order with the same company, so they don't really switch. So the only customer that you can acquire are actually new customers. However, the characteristic of a new customer is, once he's convinced to buy food online, he tends to go for the biggest one. So then if you're number four, basically, yeah, this, uh, how do you say? You're stuck between a rock and a hard place because you can spend a lot of money on advertising, but then it goes down the drain because basically all these people will go to the biggest one anyway. So he decided then to actually attract foreign capital, venture capital, I thought it was prime ventures, to actually buy number two, or no, it was actually number three in Germany because they were most similar. They were also uh, not spending or wasting too much money Uh, they had a similar strategy, and then they were basically to create a lot of synergies that enabled them to grow faster 
than number one and eventually become number one. And this was important in this industry because in this industry so much money is made in the biggest market in Germany. The UK is out of the question because there the position of just eat is too strong. He realized if we don't, if we don't become number one in Germany, it's just a matter of time until they will buy us. Because once they have the biggest market share, they will make so much money, they just buy it and then it's game over for us. So here, to a certain extent, he was investing to save money. Uh, the innovation paradox here, uh, on the one hand, to, you have to uh, make new things, innovate. On the other hand, you have to preserve or conserve, not to change too much. Here, a nice example is Max Barenburg from Bagaboo, the stroller. Most people with children probably will know what I'm talking about. The ones without, maybe not. Um, but basically what he did when he was at the design academy in, in Eindhoven, he basically started developing a stroller for men. Imagine that. Men before that time never bought a stroller. They was, weren't even involved in the decision process to, to buy a stroller. So he decided to let the market go completely. It's like I'm going for a totally different approach. I'm going to design a stroller or s some... Uh, how to say, chair to take your child for if you want to go hiking or if you want to go to the beach or if you want to go running, specifically designed for the man. But then once he designed it, he realized, but wait, if it's too new, it still has to relate to what people know. Because if it's too new, it's like the saying goes, Wall Street's graveyard is filled with men who are right too soon. They created something, it was too new, and then customers cannot relate to it, and then they don't buy it. So on the one hand, he let go of the market completely, designed something completely new, and then thought more or less backwards, okay, how can I adjust it so that it's not too new and I can actually sell it? And highly successful, by the way. Um, the adjustment paradox, I, I think that this is the main or the most important paradox for game changers. And this is uh, basically between to persevere or to pivot. This is pretty well known in the startup literature. Uh, when do you change your business model? When is it not successful anymore? When do I need to make a pivot to become more successful? And then the funny thing is that virtually all game changers that we interviewed made a number of pivots. But the most important thing uh, is not that they pivoted when it didn't go well, but that they pivoted even though it was going well. For example, uh, let's... Yeah, Geert-Jan Bruinsma, for an inter the, the, the founder of Booking.com, um, he was, uh, while, working in, uh, while doing an internship, he was working on a technology for an email fax gateway. And then on the basis of the experience that he had, he actually created a company for himself created a company where it would actually provide these services to firms because the communication between headquarters was really expensive. So he used a combination of email and fax to really lower the cost. And he was doing pretty well. He was getting a lot of assignments, making a lot of money. But he did realize, but wait, if the internet's really going to take off, then my business is going to go poof. It's going to be gone. So even though it was successful, I guess it helped that he saw the end of it, he decided to pivot and to do something else. He decided to use this technology, the email to fax gateway, and to actually use it to start a, a, a platform for uh, hotels. I see I have to hurry up. Um, so here we are basically in the book, we define 15 different paradoxes and then an apparent contradiction between different kinds of activities. So basically you say you change the game if you are uh, able to combine these apparent um, uh, contradictions. No, what the, the thing is, and this is basically the point that, but this is all, it comes a little bit later, so the order is a little bit uh, the other way around. Basically, a game, it, it's not, and this is what, that this is actually why this uh, adjustment paradox is so interesting. It's actually not that there is a brilliant inventor 
and he invents a business model, and then he implements it, and it's successful, it changes the game. This almost never happens, maybe even never. What happens is somebody starts with an idea, they start developing this idea, and then they adjust, they, they try something, call it the minimum viable product or, 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 or something, they put it in the market, they look at the response and the feedback that they get, and then they adjust. And they either incrementally adjust, or if it's really necessary, they make a complete pivot to do something completely something else. But then the reason why uh, these paradoxes are important is because they don't choose a fixed position on the continuum, or more or less, because they're balancing these opposing forces. It actually gives them the creativity, but more importantly, the flexibility to actually make this adjustment. If you take a position in uh, either of those, let's say in the mission, the idealizing versus commercializing, if you say, no, I'm going to be precisely there and I'm not going to change anymore, then this limits your adaptive capability. And then basically what you see is that a game, you don't change a game by yourself. There's not a single player that changes a game. It's in interaction with your customers, with your suppliers, with legislators. So you have to continually know when to adjust the game or to persevere. Uh, and, but then to have the flexibility to adapt and adjust, you need to balance these uh, contradicting forces, so to say, instead of choosing a position. While traditional organizations, because they're playing, uh, let's say, a fixed game, they have a fixed position and they just do that. And then they start optimizing uh, cost savings and efficiency more or less in the specific game that they're playing. But because the game initially is not defined yet, they have to be flexible enough to be able to adjust over time. Okay, can the defense, so what can ex existing players or incumbents do to defend themselves against game changers or maybe even become game changers themselves? Um, what we see is that there are a number of defensive strategies. So the existing firms can just ignore the new business model, they can just say, well, this is not our cup of tea, we ignore it. They can adjust their own business model, make it incrementally better. They can attack the new business model or they can at attack the game changer by developing a completely new proposition, partially adopt it or fully embrace it. Basically, the defensive strategy that is possible for the incumbents in is based upon, on the one hand, the threat, the size and urgency of the threat, and the responsibility. Is it possible for them to actually implement this strategy? The threat is dependent on the type of game changer that they are confronted with. And basically, there are three types of game changers. Before, I already made a distinction between the ones that create a new game, a completely new game, like Bird Control Group, group something that never existed before, do something completely new. On the other hand, you have the direct challengers. And those are the ones that in an existing game, so yep, in the, uh, the seats that you put on the back of the bike, or what Max Barenberg did with the strollers, it's an existing market with clear boundaries. There they develop a, a, a better proposition and then they directly challenge the incumbent. Or you also have what we refer to as the hidden challengers. Those that create a game or change a game on the fringe of existing markets. And a nice example is Booking.com. Booking.com basically transformed the whole travel industry. Uh, uh, a lot of tour operators lost a lot of money and are actually struggling uh, as a result of, of Booking.com. That's probably also part of the reason why you see this big consolidation, TUI be buying everything and becoming bigger and bigger and bigger because they want to become cheaper because basically their business model is under pressure. But Booking.com wasn't di a direct challenger. What they did is on the fringe of the market for direct hotel reservations, they de uh, developed a platform so you could directly book a hotel. But when he started this, this was about 5% uh, of travel agencies slash tour operators revenues. So it was marginal because nobody booked their own hotel. Why? Also because it was a pain in the ass. 
I mean, you have to book a hotel in Spain, you have to talk Spanish, if you want to compare it with, if, if you know what the facilities are and all these things, your Spanish have to be, has to be pretty proficient, you have to call a lot of times. There's really a pain in the ass. So, but initially, he started out, he just kept going, and uh, but then one of the things that made booking so successful is actually the budget airlines. Only the budget, because the budget airlines allowed people to compose booking their own hotels with booking a cheap flight and actually compose a package that would be much better than the traditional standard packages that were offered by the tour operators. Because they were able to buy, I don't know if this is actually uh, scientific, you probably know better than I do, but these uh, big tour operators were probably able to buy cheaper flights because they would buy them in bulk. They would be able to buy cheaper hotel rooms because they would be able to buy them in bulk. Because of booking, people could actually buy the, uh, or, or reserve the hotel rooms that were not rented out anyway. So to a, uh, for a lower price and in combination with the cheap uh, airlines, people could actually construct their own uh, travel packages, more custom made instead of standardized. So uh, to recap, Ideal types, obviously you can have mixes between these ideal types. Creators create a new game. Direct challengers basically change the rule in an existing game. And the indirect or the hidden challengers not only change the rule, but they change the borders. Um, the threat related to this is that direct challengers, generally uh, the threat is bigger and the urgency is also higher. And for the hidden challengers, the size of the threat is smaller and the urgency is lower. The reason why a direct challenger, the size is bigger, is because it's a direct alternative for the existing business model. Uh, to use the example of Bing Bunk again, uh, before Bing Bunk, people used to place orders, buy and sell stocks by calling uh, a, a broker. They have to talk to an account manager. It takes a lot of time, it's expensive, and they basically offer a different model. You go to the internet, you buy and sell stocks, Boof, that's it. So it's a completely, it's a direct alternative. While for the hidden challenger, it's not. Because booking.com, when booking started, was not a direct alternative for using a tour operator. It took longer, it was not a direct threat. So the urgency was also lower um, because it also took time for booking to make a number of iterations, to get the hotels and for the uh, budget airlines to become really cheaper. And then generally what you also see is the direct channel challengers, because they offer a direct alternative for the business model or for the proposition, they're actually able to wipe out a firm completely. And with hidden challengers, uh, generally a part of the market will still be uh, the traditional model. Uh, for example, in the case of booking, uh, this can also be seen by the uh, new game changer Travel Bird who's basically also a tour operator who constructs packages. Some people like it. Some people like other people to construct a package that they like, maybe a little bit of culture, maybe a little bit of this or high end. So there's still a market for it. So they're not completely uh, obliterated. Uh, to assess the size of the threat, and this is based on, uh, uh, well, the ones you, who were at Blue Ocean uh, probably know this figure. This is just a strategy canvas or a proposition canvas where basically you look at different elements of the proposition and then score what the alternative business models, how well the alternative business models are performing. Performing, And this you can actually use to assess the size and urgency of the threat. Here I contrast the proposition by the big banks of buying and selling stock and the proposition of Bing Bank. And then the major difference is the traditional banks, you have to use the telephone to place orders. You have an account manager. The cost is, tends to be high. Why? Because you need an account manager. Customer service tends to be low. Why? You only have a, number, a limited number of account managers. What do the account managers do? They only serve the high volume customers because they make the most money. And if you're a low volume customer, yeah, then you're uh, not help so much. Um, so what, do what does Bing do? Okay, make it available through internet, focus on uh, low price, focus on uh, customer service, customer intimacy, and be better. 
offer more, offer free uh, news, free prices of the stocks, so people can make decisions. They don't have to read the tele financial telegraph or whatever, and also some tools to analyze their portfolio. So then basically, if you look at these two models, then you would say that this one is really superior. But then to assess the size of the threat, and this is what, where it gets interesting, at least this is what I think, basically the size and the urgency of the threat is dependent upon these two factors, order by telephone and internet. So the extent to which people are actually able to make the transition to this new proposition is dependent on A, do they have internet? Otherwise it's not possible. And are they proficient enough to use the internet to make orders? So then if you would be this bank and you would have to make an assessment, then you would have to start looking at internet pen penetration rates, proficiency of internet to actually quantify or make an assessment or how big and, and how urgent is this threat. Um, there are a number of defensive strategies uh, I mentioned before. You can ignore a business model, improve the existing business model, attack, adopt, or embrace. I improve your business model. Basically what this means is originally, let's say this is the traditional offering of a, a, a physical store and they don't do anything online, so this is gone. And then suddenly they're confronted with Cool Blue or Ball.com who sells everything online. So price is lower, they don't have any stores, quality might be lower or higher, I just put in something but they do have direct sales, they do have an online help desk, they do have a web shop, and currently you as a store don't have it yet. Now what you can do not to mitigate the threat, threat completely is you can adjust your business model, you can add an online help desk and a web shop, and it might not be as good as quality as, let's say, Ball.com or Cool Blue, but because of your reputational advantages, this way it would you could actually prevent, uh, how do you say, you can reduce the size of the threat and also make it less urgent, so not so many people actually make this transition. So basically you just add some elements on the basis of the new proposition offered by the game changer to your existing business model. An alternative, this is actually a pretty nice one, I think. Uh, this is the example of Swatch. And here the traditional Swiss uh, watchmakers had the Omegas, the Brightlings, the Rolexes, high price, high exclusive, high, highly exclusive, and very precise. But then with the advent of quartz technology, there were a lot of Asian watch manufacturers, and they said, okay, we're gonna make a watch that's low in price, it's not exclusive, it's precise enough, we're using quartz technology, and that's it. So that's the orange one. And they were actually eating away a lot of market share from the Swiss uh, watchmakers. And there was really a lot of pressure on these Swiss, Swiss watchmakers, and they were afraid they would go out of business. So what did they do? They worked together. I don't know precisely which brands. A number of brands decided to work together and come up with a whole new proposition, the Swatch. And they decided to, it's a little bit higher in price than the Asians, ex but it's more exclusive, precision is the same, and we're actually gonna add some additional elements, style and variety, so it becomes more of a fashion item. Uh, uh, so then it actually position a watch more as a fashion item to prevent people from, well, not just from switching, but then at least if the ones that make a switch, at least they switch, you cannibalize your own profits and not, uh, they're not cannibalized by a competitor. So what you're doing here is you have your traditional proposition, you create a new one, and basically you play two games. Uh, you have two business models, can be in two entities or units. Um, to in the book, we talk about these defensive strategies and then we explain uh, how easy or difficult it is for certain strategies. For example, if you want to improve your business model, if you are faced with a direct challenger who offers uh, an alternative for your, uh, or a better business model, it's easy to improve your existing business model because you can just add the elements of the proposition that are better by the game changer. If it's a hidden challenger, it's difficult because initially they're targeting non-customers or a fringe of the market. And then if you start changing your own business model, it can become less attractive. 
So then basically the choice of which defensive strategy is possible depends on the challenger you're uh, faced with. Basically, if you look at the defensive strategy, it depends on the threat, the size of the threat, and the responsibility. Uh, if there's a large threat and you have a high responsibility, you can either attack, attack, or adopt. Adopt basically means, I didn't explain it yet, adopt means that you're basically copying the business model of the game changer, and you're also playing two games. So you have your traditional business model, you copy their business model, you put it in a separate entity, like uh, KLM is doing with Transavia, although that already existed a long time, to actually fight against these budget airlines, but still having their own business as well. But then basically you're playing two games. If you're attacking, you're also playing two games. Here you completely make the transition to the new business model, but then using the, the uh, often incumbent firms, and this is something that uh, they don't realize, have a number of really uh, valuable resources and capabilities that they can use and are actually needed to successfully change the game. So then in some cases, if they just make the switch and then use their existing distribution channels or use their production capabilities, they can actually just take over the business model and become the game changer uh, and, and annihilate the original challenger. In playing two games, the literature, especially the innovation, innovation literature, often argues to be uh, to do it in a separate unit. So to create a different company, I think in the case of KLM, Transavia is a different company, I don't know for sure. So a completely separate legal entity uh, to avoid conflict. However, conflicts are only part of the story because there are also synergies. And then basically the decision whether to separate or to integrate depends on how many synergies are, uh, can you generate and what are the potential conflicts. If there are a lot of syner potential synergies, a lot of potential conflicts, generally you want to go for a phased integration. You want to go for integration to be able to realize the synergies, cost savings, so on and so forth. On the other hand, you want to do it in a phased approach, approach to avoid the conflict. And the same for uh, uh, if you have few conflicts and few synergies then you want to go for a phase separation. And you want to go for a phase separation because initially you want to integrate, you want to build on the existing resources and capabilities to jumpstart the process and then phase it out. Um, okay, Dutch dance. This is... Can I ask a question about sure. uh, two slides back? Two slides back, um, yes. If we, for example, now we have Elon Musk uh, or other companies that are working on Hyperloop, mm -hmm. Hyperloop transport with the with cost of trains and uh, flights etc mm -hmm. how would you uh, rate it because it, it takes a lot of time for them to develop the technology and the infrastructure to actually make that happen mm -hmm. but once it's there it's cheaper and faster than our um, business model yes well i would classify them as a uh, hidden challenger because they're not really uh, at, at the moment, they're not really offering uh, a, a viable solution that people can use. So it's still on the fringe of the market. If you want to develop it, it's also highly, uh, how do you say, uh, dependent upon the infrastructure because you have to create a hyperloop between the different hubs. Uh, so it will take a long time to, uh, to develop. So they're not really, it, at the moment, it's not really a direct challenger yet. So it's more uh, of a hidden challenger. But it can really uh, uh, transform or be a real threat to the. I would, yeah, I would say it's a, it's it's a big threat, and and, and most. Uh, which defensive strategy would that be? Because it's a high threat, and we're not faced of to adapt quickly to that because I don't foresee that KLM is able to move into the same technology. So then. Yeah, the responsibility, it, it depends. I have to be honest, I don't know too much about this Hyperloop technology. So I don't know the, 
to give another example, because to be honest, I don't know much enough about the technology to really give a proper response. What the South or the OPEC is often doing is actually driving down oil prices to make the uh, oil production in the United States, where they use different, more expensive technologies, less attractive. So this is a strategy that KLM, for example, could also employ. So reducing the price, while so thereby making the investment of the whole project uh, a lot less attractive. Uh, I'm not saying whether this is something that with, whether this is something uh, that would work. Uh, and in the long run, I guess uh, it makes more sense because what I know from the technology is that they use these vacuum tubes to travel with, uh, uh, how do you say, really low resistance levels. If you look at an airplane, they use a lot of fuel. And now you have the whole sustainability. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's why I asked this. Actually. Yeah, I know you have the whole the sustainability debate, the CO2 and whatever. And I don't know precisely, but I thought the airplanes are pretty high up in the polluters. so. It's just, and, and, and oil is running out, so it's on, unless there will be some kind of electric. But then still, you have the air friction, and if you're in a vacuum tube, you can reduce this air friction. So in that sense, you could go to a different model where there's at least initially, how do you say, uh, uh, certain hubs, major hubs, are connected by these hyperloops. And then, you know, basically, you have the hub and spoke model that you have now uh, in, in the airline industry but then with the combination. Like now you have, let's say you use airlines and buses to go somewhere, then you would use these hyperloops and airplanes, but then airplanes for the, 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 the int or intracontinental flights or something. Could be. Could be. Could be. But this is really, an, uh, I think, to a certain extent, it's also, uh, you could also talk about the car industry, petrol, there, what will, how do you say, why it will really take a long time is on the one hand, you have the investments in the hyperloops. Uh, you also have a lot of, uh, it's not fully developed yet. And you, ha you have currently a really large infrastructure of airplanes. So it will take a long time before they are actually phased out. But most likely in the long term, they will be phased out, at least to a certain extent. Okay, the Dutch dance. This is the in-depth longitudinal study of uh, electronic dance. Basically, if you're looking at this game or the creation of this game, then uh, here you can notice two kinds of revolutions. You have the first revolution, which is more the uh, music uh, technical music creation uh, revolution, Eddie de Klerk, who basically introduced house music in the Netherlands, I believe it was in the Roxy, experimenting with it. Here it was also more for the innovators and the early adopters. And then the second revolution is to make it more mainstream. Many people maybe know Duncan Stutterheim, the CEO of, of ID&T. Uh, is he still? Because he sold it and I don't know if he bought it back. But basically, at a certain point, because Duncan Stutterheim, ID&T, were having these Thunderdome parties, which were more for the subculture, the harder music. It was not really mainstream. And at a certain point, he realized that, okay, if we really want to be successful with electronic music, we have to go mainstream. We have to, uh, how do you say, say goodbye to the subculture and actually go for more commercial uh, commercial music, so strategic reorganization. But the main point is what we observe in the Dutch dance that a big game is never changed by a single player. You need others. You not only need the musicians, the DJs, you also need the ones that organize the parties, the one that sell the music, and then to cross-pollinate. There's a cross-pollination needed, and then an also an iterative adjustment over time to make it a success. And then also, not to uh, forget Richard Selsma, who also played a, an important role. He was, he invented the Amsterdam dance event, which is the most successful dance event in the world, which is this week in Amsterdam, if I'm correct. Um, 
So for, on the basis of this, we can develop a systemic perspective of game changers where you have the, the central supply chain with the suppliers, the producers, and the consumers more or less, where there needs to be a cross-pollination between them, but also supporting uh, industries like finance, media, uh, played an important role for some of the game changers. And then, but because basically a game is not just, you ju it's not just producer and consumer, there's a whole, uh, a number of players involved and they all have to be convinced to start playing a different game. So to wrap things up, the insights, uh, well basically there are two different stages of the game. There's a change of the game and then an optimization of the game. A change of the game, you define a new game, the rules are fluid, the boundaries are fluid, uh, high levels of uncertainty, a lot of experimentation with new business models, a lot of iteration to find the business model that actually will change the game. Once this is done, there's an optimization. The optimization is the rules and the borders are more or less fixed. Uh, limited uncertainty, organization and individuals can specialize and there can be a segmentation of customers. And then after a certain point in time, there will be a change again. And this cycle is going faster. Uh, the conclusion, well, this is basically a summary of what I've mentioned already. Um, here, looking specifically at the reason why some firms uh, fail to respond to changes in the game is they don't see it coming. This is often argued that they don't, they don't see the changes coming. The funny thing is, and this is related to point four, that it's often they do see it coming, but it's not considered as a threat. And to give an example, both Max Barenberg, who invented the bugaboo, when he invented this new radical design, the, the stroller for men, he actually went to all these stroll producers, the, I forgot the names, the, I think Maxi Cozy and Mutsaat. He went to all of them because he originally he wanted to license out his design. So he went to all of them and he said, I have this new radical design for a new stroller. You can conquer the market. And everybody said, not interested, not interested, not interested. So he basically offered it to them and they said, no, we're not interested. And then he s decided, okay, then I'm going to do it myself. And he basically wiped most of them off uh, of the competitive landscape. Precisely the same thing happened with Yep, the one that produced these child things for on the bike, the child seats on the bike. He was actually the one, Michael Krupting, I think his name was, he was actually the one who designed the first bike or the first child seat on the bike. But then he went to a different industry. At a certain point, he decided he wanted to come back and he looked at the industry and he saw, well, they're still using my same design. I think it's time for something new. He contacted all of these producers, especially Bowbike, which had a monopoly. And he said, listen, I designed your first seat. It's highly successful. You've become a monopolist with this. I have a new design. I have a new plan. Let's do it together and conquer the world. Not interested. We're, we have a monopoly. We're making a lot of money. You're talking about investing. Not interested. Five years time, Bowbike bankrupt. And Yep was actually the monopolist. Often there is also a difference in opinions of CEOs, CFOs, uh, CTOs, and go on, so on and so forth. Negative business case, capital within traditional organization or within multinational enterprises tends to be impatient. At the bottom line, what does it deliver? While if you look at Booking.com, Geertje uh, on Bruinsma or Takeaway, they started before the internet was big and it's actually a pain in the ass to book a hotel room via the internet. It took a lot longer than just taking the phone. You could, it was easier to learn a language and do it directly by phone than do it by the, via the internet. And the same for takeaway. Generally, you used to order food through telephone calls, but then using the internet it was much tougher, but they did it anyway and they stuck with it. So even though it might have appeared a negative business case, they did it because of the passion, because of how, because of the fact that they saw that the internet would become big so they did it anyway, but this is often really difficult in a traditional organization where projects compete for resources and then ROIs, uh, you name it. Uh, marketing and sales is not the same as innovation. 
So you cannot really effectively combat a game changer, a new business model with increased marketing and sales because that's just a temporary stopgap and you will lose because if it's really a radical innovation, you will lose. And often too little too late. So then once it's actually a threat, then they start doing things, uh, but then it's too late. This concludes my presentation. Any questions? Yes. Yes. We did this. I forgot to mention this. I think I don't think I put this on the first slide or one of the first slides. What we did is um, because the 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 research was funded by SMS, and the Stichting Management Studies is mostly mostly interested in the Dutch uh, in Dutch firms. Uh, this is the reason why we concentrated on Dutch firms. What we did do is we did study 10 uh, international game changers. I have to, s I don't think they're on this slide. Uh, yeah, we did do an analysis of 10 historic game changers by analyzing a number of their autobiographies. And the, some of the companies that we analyzed were Google. I th most of them are in here. Uh, let's see. Ford was in there, McDonald's, Walt Disney, Virgin, Microsoft, Google, Zara, Apple. So basically what we did there is we, we actually studied autobiographies, so not biographies by others, but the autobiographies and also coded them uh, and, 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 and uh, how to say, also used the same grounded methodology, grounded theory approach to actually come up with these patterns. Although it was much more difficult uh, because in the interviews, even though the interviews were unstructured, we had interviews with the founders. Uh, it was also a bit more recent because McDonald's goes back a long time uh, and we could actually go into a discussion or a debate with the founders. So there is definitely a bias towards Dutch uh, firms. But some of these Dutch firms, Booking.com for example, Elastic, they're also highly successful internationally. So uh, I'm not really confident to uh, how to say, generalize our results to the whole world. But I do think that there are certain patterns uh, uh, which are universally applicable. Other questions, remarks, complaints? What do you think will be the biggest game changer for the aviation industry? The biggest game changer for the aviation industry. Phew. Yeah, you probably said it yourself, the hyper loop. No? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on the aviation industry. Well, unless there's, uh, how do you say, the uh, Star Trek technology of beam me up, Scotty, will be, uh, will be realized. I think that there's, yeah, if you're talking about, let's say, the physical transport or the yeah, physical transportation of people and goods, then... Um, I doubt it. The last mile, I think. I mean, in, 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 in aviation, as far as I know, you already have the hub and spoke network where you have like these major pipelines, so to say, from 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 an important hub from Schiphol to 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 either uh, Paris or to uh, uh, the United States, and then there internally you will have this distribution. So, but and then but generally, if you compare the amount of energy that is required to transport a certain amount of mass, because people and goods are basically mass, from point A to point B. If there are indeed a number of these big hubs, it makes sense to just make a, a, a wormhole. No, it's, I thought it was mostly based on the wormhole idea from Star Trek. So then I, would, I, I think that that would be the most, uh, yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. How much of that can be attributed to luck or skill or ability? A lot. A lot. Are a lot of companies actually 
a lot. Well, no, yeah, well, a lot of them were at the right place at the right time. On the other hand, like I said before, uh, it, it, it's not only luck um, because, uh, uh, because of the reason that it's not uh, some visionary entrepreneur thinking about a business model and implementing it. But to give an example of uh, birth control group, it's not really a, 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 a game changer yet, it's more of a challenger. Was Steiner Henskens, apparently he also competed in judo on some higher level. Uh, but what he did, he started, he started, uh, he became an entrepreneur when he was 18 and he started importing uh, brommerspullen. I don't know how you call them in, in English. Like these, yeah, for, for, for engine parts, for, for these, mo not motorbikes, but these mopeds or whatever. And that even though he was al also making money, it was not really what he was interested in. So he decided to switch to electronic parts. And then while he was importing electronic parts, he noticed that he was getting more and more requests for lasers. Because these lasers, farmers could actually use them to chase away birds when they just planted crops and these things. Um, and then this actually transitioned to more and more farmers asking him to, to actually automate this and also to make these lasers more efficient. So basically he was just doing something and because other, people's were, uh, other people were asking it, he decided to jump into the gap or the opportunity. So on the one hand you could say, okay, he was lucky, but then on the other hand he had to be there to be able to be lucky. You see, but I do think, and this is and this is the problem from, uh, I think a lot of the popular press, and also a lot of the management books, is if you read the story about Google, or if you read the story about Amazon, it's like uh, Jeff Bezos had this idea, and I'm going to do this, and it's going to be successful, and every decision that he made was perfect, and they basically leave out all the mistakes that they made, uh, and it it seems like a really coherent person, he seems like a, a, a brilliant dude, while the element of luck is, 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 is more or less yeah, shoved to the background, because people want to read a story about a hero, because then they have the impression, I can learn from it, I can also become a Jeff Bezos. So... Yeah, but this is the, the this is this is the, the the how do you say the challenge with the let's say the adjustment paradox or also with the vision paradox, because if you you have to persevere to overcome the obstacles and to know what works and what doesn't, but if you adjust all the time, then basically you're like a, a, a ship on the sea without a captain. You're just going everywhere, so you do need this point at the horizon. Uh, to go and to know which direction you're going, but then you have to be flexible that if it's really windy, you can adjust your course a little bit. Do you want to no, no. add something? Okay. okay. Yeah. Yes, about, uh, sir. Apple had a game changer. Yes. They uh, took a seven year thing before they were a real game changer. To a certain extent. Well, I would argue that actually they were a, a game changer before, but they were actually not really able to monetize it, I mean, given the fact that Microsoft stole their whole graphic operating system, uh, which already was a real game changer, uh, they didn't really change the game, uh, they just invented the technology uh, and were not really able to profit from it. The same problem has Philips a little bit. Uh, they're also really innovative, but a bit more uh, struggling with the marketing. Um, true, true. And that actually proves that even though most would argue that to be a game changer you have to, uh, and this is uh, well known in the academic literature, if you want to change something, if you want to come up with a radical innovation, it tends not to originate from within the industry, but from without the industry. But this is also something that we don't really find completely because, where are they? here, because for example, uh, Aosta, Volker Engelsmann, he worked in the, in the industry. 
um, uh, also, where is he? Yep, to a certain extent. Uh, where is the other one? Verzekering, no. Buurtzorg, uh, Jos, Jos Blok. He was actually working in the, the, the buurtzorg. I don't know the English term by now. And then from there on, he decided, hey, this is not right. I'm going to do it something, I'm going to do it differently. Uh, also, I don't I mean, Matos, as far or less. So basically, uh, even though they say, well, it's this and this and this, game changes can originate from everything. I mean, you can work, be working for a company, you can be frustrated on how things are going, uh, and then you can decide, hey, I want to do something differently. And then if you don't have the ability to do so within the organization, let's say through entrepreneurship or, or uh, corporate venturing or whatever, then you go outside. Although often for so sometimes it is there is a, at a certain point the need to go outside, to break loose from existing structures, from existing technologies. Uh, so even though the idea might originate from within, sometimes it does pay off for... Uh, but this is wh what I was saying also a little bit before. Um, the impression that you get from especially the management literature is like that a really a clear set of rules or prescriptions can be developed that if you follow them you will be successful. But this to a large extent is just uh, them marketing their books and theories because the world is more complex than uh, just following a set of fixed guidelines. Any more questions or remarks? No? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We have a small gift. If okay. you took the time to, uh, to come here. It's thank a, you. a plane. We hope uh, it's also a bit innovative, a bit uh, game yeah. changing that we change the color. Uh, <laughs> yesterday thank there you. was actually um, uh, a documentary about uh, Buurtzorg and uh, they're changing the game so drastically that he's now even after 10 or 11 years considering to move into... Uh, uh, short verzekeraars, insurances. Okay. So uh, next year he will start his own uh, insurance company. Yeah. Uh, and I hope it inspires us uh, also to be open to the ideas that come from outside because what I've learned from examples like YEP is that sometimes it's just handed to you on a plate and you're too focused on what we're doing that we forget that there are really good ideas outside. Hmm. And on the other hand, also to be open to them the slower boiling things that uh, will come up uh, in the future. So, and then I hope definitely that your uh, research will help us in uh, defending or attacking the, the other. Yeah, actually the research that we're doing now, which is also really, because to a certain extent it's a bit related to this, to disruption, it's actually about data-driven organizations and then an organizations making the transition from intuitive decision-making on the basis of intuition and experience to actually moving more towards data-driven uh, decision-making. So then, and to actually combat the cognitive and the decision-making biases, like confirmation bias, you confirm that what you already believe in. You believe that what you're doing is the right model. And this is a bit of, little bit related to the vision paradox. You believe so much, everything else, you just assume that it's not there or you adjust to confirm your pre-existing beliefs. So, oh, uh, Marcel, maybe it's nice for you uh, to do it. Marcel's working on, I think, that topic. So, uh, okay. Well, thanks uh, a lot again. Yes, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.